Okay, well, why don't we go ahead and get started and welcome um, everybody today to our the second in our series of of, um, of, of short seminars from uh, looking at our 50th anniversary celebration um, today. Oh, the series um, will be ongoing throughout the year. Um, won't be every Monday, but but most, if not all of them, will be on Mondays. And they're from 1.30 to 2, so I'm looking forward to it, and I hope you all can join. There's the schedule. Our next one is on June, coming up on June 3rd. So today I'm thrilled to have um, Menas Mavrikakis join us today. Um, he has been a user for 24 years, we counted, um, which is a long time. He's at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and he's the PI of MP351. So if you've been at NERSC for any length of time, I'm sure you're familiar with MP3, MP351, because I counted up as best I could tell. Um, in the 23 years that that project's been enforced, they've run almost one and a half million jobs. And if you count up all the hours and weight them toward to, you know, um, for that year in Normalize, um, this project has used the fifth most hours of any project at NERSC. Um, but perhaps most impressively, they have 225 publications that have come out of their research, and they've been very good, and we appreciate it uh, for acknowledging NERSC and with that, I'm just going to turn it over to Dr. Mavrikakis, who's going to tell us today about first principle. Well, you're going to tell us about reaction-driven formation of no uh, novel active sites on catalytic surfaces. Okay, very good. Well, uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction, very generous introduction, Richard. It's a pleasure for me to be here today, an honor to participate in the uh, 50th anniversary. Um, my first thing I want to do is to wish a happy birthday to NERSC, and many, many more decades to come, well beyond our lifetimes, everyone who is here today. Um, as Richard mentioned, our group has benefited from CPU allocations from NERSC very extensively. We are deeply appreciative of not only the resources, but perhaps even more so, the contributions of the personnel that has um, month or um, uh, uh, taking care of all businesses related to NERSC. We started out in the fall of 2000. Here I managed to uh, find out the very first email I received as a young PI then for a NERSC startup award for the legendary Francesca Verdia, uh, who was then the group leader at NERSC User Services. You see the timestamp is October 20th, 2000. They will, uh, she was announcing to me a startup award for the very impressive number here, 10,000 MPPP hours on um, an SP system they used to have there at NERSC. I was thrilled to receive that message. That was the uh, beginning of uh, an interaction, a collaboration that has lasted 20, nearly 24, 25 years now. We supported uh, numerous publications on here, 225. And perhaps even more importantly, um, the, the existence of these resources and uh, taking care of them over the years has contributed to the education of 31 PhDs from my research group, several masters and bachelor students. This is the main mission, I believe, of Department of Energy, one of them, which is workhorse, uh, workhorse development. So we are extremely thankful. Now, the next slide, I've actually um, dug out my first interaction with Richard. That was um, a few weeks after the, we got the Startup Award. It was then NERSC User Services um, member of the team, December of 2000, and um, since then we've interacted greatly with Richard. We are also particularly appreciative of all of his contributions to our ongoing research efforts. And then the next slide I have um, is a typical pattern that developed over the years. Uh, since year one, um, we are pretty aggressive, it turns out, students, postdocs in the group in terms of utilizing these resources quite efficiently. So I would send out a note um, to NERSC that MP351 is out of time. 
we need more time if available, keep us in mind. And then oftentimes I would get uh, responses of this nature. This was already for the startup award that I mentioned in the earlier slide. Three months later or so, we were apparently um, advanced to production status. And then year after year, uh, we were uh, given these mid-year allocations after quarters, given the quarter system that NERSC has implemented. And Richard informed me uh, recently our project grew up to become the fifth most uh, NERSC hours um, uh, of any other project since 2005. Uh, for a total of uh, 3,027 total NERSC hours since two, uh, two, 2005. We are greatly, greatly appreciative of this tremendous opportunity. I, I would dare to say very little of what we accomplished uh, in research of this quarter of a century would have been accomplished without NERSC. So having started out with this brief introduction that reflects our feelings about NERSC and the importance of these computational resources for our research to fulfill the mission of the Department of Energy, I would like to spend a few minutes on a brief introduction, the problem that is at the heart of the Catalyst Science that is being funded by the Catalyst Science Program of DOE uh, for the past 20 plus uh, years. Uh, for the non-experts in the audience, I would mention Catalyst is, is the science that deals with materials that are uh, utilized in chemical reactors without being consumed during the reaction, they simply accelerate the chemical reaction. And what that means is that the lower the energy need consumption for having the chemical transformation going. So instead of utilizing say 200 degrees Celsius for a certain transformation, if you have the appropriate catalyst, you can run the same reactor at 100 degrees Celsius, which obviously saves lots of energy, uh, produced uh, energy that needs to be used for, uh, for the industrial setup. And it's remarkably interesting to notice that catalysis is relevant to approximately 9% 90% of all products that we as humans encounter in our lifetime, so plastics, uh, fuels, uh, pharmaceuticals, you name it. Catalysis is almost a universal um, uh, field that affects the lives of all of us. So what I'm going to discuss with you briefly today is a project that um, started out inspired by some experimental results that were shared with me by Gabor Somorzai and Miguel Salmeron. Both of these individuals are colleagues of yours at NERSC, uh, not strictly speaking NERSC, but Berkeley, the National Laboratory in the Material Science uh, Department. And uh, Gabor uh, has been a professor in chemistry, Miguel in uh, the Material Science at the UC Berkeley campus. So I was visiting with them on my sabbatical, um, uh, thanks to Miller Institute in the spring of 2019. And um, uh, I will then share with you what uh, came out of that uh, project. So the results that were shown to me by Miguel and uh, Gabor at the time was uh, are summarized in this series of snapshots, uh, four snapshots. All of this is scanning tunnel in microscopy. They have one of the world record performing instruments of high pressure, and by high pressure, I mean up to 10 tor. Uh, for those not uh, familiar with these units, uh, 760 tor is one atmosphere, so it's still below atmosphere, but because electrons are tunneling from the tip of the uh, microscope to the surfaces uh, right below it, um, they cannot really travel too much if there is thick atmosphere of gases or liquids. So that's why this is the highest we can go up until today. So what is shown here on the left-hand side is a copper single crystal, copper 111, the hexagonally packed surface, the most stable facet. This is a terrace of this hexagonally packed uh, set of atoms. This is another terrace here, another terrace. Notice the yardstick here is 25 nanometers under vacuum, okay? Um, 
Now, gradually they started letting some carbon monoxide in, 0.1 tor, 0.2 tor, up to 10 tor, and then they zoomed in with their microscope and looked at uh, the monatomic step edges separating terraces, and you can clearly see that even with this tiny amount of CO, you start seeing some corrugation on the step edges. If you then double the pressure of CO and you zoom out, go back to this length scale, you now see lots of dots on the terraces uh, and close to the step edges and all around. Uh, these are clusters of copper atoms, it turns out. And then if you go to even higher pressure and you zoom in back, you see uh, much more corrugation compared to the previous uh, cases. And with the STM, they managed to figure out that each one of these clusters of copper atoms is more or less something that is uh, schematically shown here. This is like a two-dimensional pancake of copper atoms, where if you count the blue atoms uh, representing copper atoms is 19. And then you see the CO molecules decorating the circumferential uh, copper atoms, and then you have one CO molecule at the center of the copper pancake as well. Of course, you have clusters of different uh, number of uh, copper atoms, but the most um, stable one is this one with 19, it turns out, per experiments done in somerized laboratories. So the question that we have here is everybody, at least in the computational catalysis community and beyond, even in the standard catalysis community, has been talking that the terraces or the step edges or the king sites at most are the active sites that are responsible for the catalytic chemical transformation. The question we need to address now is that these new features developing under reactive environments, that is copper ad clusters, are they relevant for catalysis? Do they accelerate the reaction or it is still these other sites, um, the terra sites, the step edge sites that dominate catalysis? Another question that's interesting to pose here is this is a very specific system. Sion copper. What happens if you go, say, to Sion platinum, Sion rhodium? Well, it turns out the same method, similar uh, conditions. They couldn't find any uh, cluster formation. So why that is the case? And what would happen if we go to other reactive species beyond carbon monoxide, which is a very common reactive intermediate uh, for catalytic transformations? So to start out uh, discussing the theoretical and computational network uh, framework that we developed to understand this, I will show here a cartoon that shows you an upper terrace, a lower terrace of this copper 111 single crystal or any metal that we'll discuss. The green atoms represent the step edge and other step edge where two step edges meet is a king site. And then you have ejection of atoms um, from the steps or the king sides. You form add atoms, these blue atoms, with or without an adsorbent. This red uh, sphere represents an adsorbent. Then these ejected add atoms start diffusing on the surface. They meet each other and they aggregate, they generate dimers, trimers, etc. This heptamer, a nice uh, uh, structure here. So the idea here is to evaluate the energetics of each one of these processes, that is the ejection of atoms first, the diffusion, and eventually the aggregation towards cluster formation. And because they say that um, a picture is worth a thousand words, what I would like to do now is to um, uh, show you um, the standard cube octahedron, which is what most catalysis practitioners will have in mind for transition metal catalysis. This is a, a silver uh, used for ammonia oxidation for all practical purposes. Here you see one facet with tetragonal symmetry. Here is another facet um, of the nanoparticle with hexagonal symmetry. These are step edges. Uh, here you have a corner site. Etc. And here I have an ammonia molecule coming down from the gas phase. And then you see a pair of scissors for breaking silver-silver bonds and generating an add atom with ammonia on top of it. Imagine now that you do this with much richer environment, high, higher numbers of ammonia molecules. And here is what is the new picture that develops for steady-steady catalysis. So what's the difference here? You have the 
<laughs> pre-existing, excuse me, um, uh, terraces, uh, facets, that you have the original vision for the active sites in the nanoparticle. But in addition, you have these structures, the green uh, colored structures, that is a heptamer, a tetramer, another tetramer, a trimer, etc., a dimer. And the question is, which one of these sites now, the old fashioned uh, sites here, of the extended surfaces, the edges, are dominant or these new features that are developing under reactive environment, breaking the metal-metal bonds, uh, could be dominating reactivity. So that's what we are interested. So this is the picture I would like to uh, for you guys to keep in mind at the end of this um, lecture, if anything, uh, if everything else goes away. So the framework that uh, we then established was very simple to evaluate the energetics of ad atom formation. Um, here is the ejection source, depending on the geometry from where you eject an atom, a metal atom from. This is the hexagonally packed 111 facet for FCC metals. This is a step edge uh, under coordinated. Here you see the step edge across section U. This is a king site, um, most under coordinated. The energetics will be different. So here you start with, um, say, the uh, these. Uh, king site, you see this um, purple color atom, and then you take this atom and you deposit it in another slab that represents an adjacent facet of one, 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 one. So this is the final state. This is the ad atom, this is the vacancy, and then you ask the question, what is the reaction energy for this? How difficult, costly, energetically is to eject a king atom to go there, or a step edge atom, or a terrace atom? And this is under vacuum, and this is in the presence of adsorbates. Of course, the adsorbate could affect the reactivity uh, quite a lot, um, and that's why we are uh, probing this um, uh, as well, the right-hand side column. And here is now some results. We use density functional theory. We run the VASP code on, uh, on uh, uh, and NERSC resources. And for the experts of the audience, we use the exchange correlation functional, which is the PBE. There's many flavors one could use. This appears to be the best in terms of uh, describing the cohesive energy and the adsorbate uh, solid interactions the best. Um, so here on the x-axis, uh, we've uh, plotted it or uh, presented the eight FCC metals that we studied. And the relative order in which they appear reflects the hardness of the metal, that is the cohesive energy per experiment as um, uh, reported in Charles Kittel uh, classic text uh, here. So silver is the, weak, the softest of the metal, iridium uh, is the hardest of these FCC metals. And here with this purple line, you can read off the experimental bulk cohesive energy for each one of these metals from the right-hand side vertical axis. What you can read from the left-hand side vertical axis is in electron volts, and one electron volt is approximately 100 kilojoules per mole for the uh, non-expert in electron volts. Okay, and it is under vacuum what we calculated to be the energy needed in order to eject an atom from a terrace or from a step edge or from a kink atom. So for each metal, you have three different sources. And obviously, the shortest bar is the red one that corresponds to ejecting the least coordinated kink atom compared to the terrace and the um, step edge atom. So this is not surprising news. And then as, as you go from left to right, from the softest to the hardest metal, one thing that you notice is that the, the height of the bars keeps increasing. So the harder the metal, the more difficult naturally it is to extract metal atoms from it, to break the metal metal bonds. The last thing I want to point out here is this three quarters of an electron volt uh, dust line, which we deliberately drew to emphasize that a, a process, an Arrhenius type of process, a rate process, that um, has a barrier of 0.75 electron volts, you will have at room temperature one event per second. So if you are below this, as you are on silver and gold, for instance, then you have one ejection, uh, one metal atom ejection per second, 
from the king side, even under vacuum. So it's a dynamic process, yet an endergonic process, okay? Um, now, the, if you look on the right-hand side of this plot, uh, we've taken the red bars from the left. That shows you how difficult it is to eject metal atoms uh, from the king side. And then we compare with the green bars, new data, that tells you how difficult it is to eject an atom in the presence of CO. That is the um, dilute limit uh, of CO. One molecule in the unit cell, it's 114 to the monolayer. So two classes of metals, one is the noble metals, the coinage metals. You see the green bar is lower than the red bar, which means the presence of adsorbed CO facilitates the ejection of metal atoms, whereas the remaining uh, non-coinage metals, actually the green bar is higher, taller than the red bar, which means that CO decelerates uh, or stabilizes the metal instead of helping eject atoms from it. This is actually good news if you go back to a slide where I presented experimental data on rhodium and platinum, people could not really identify any cluster formation. Now going from CO to other um, uh, reactants uh, that are common in catalysis, uh, that is thermal catalysis, electrocatalysis, we've expanded our studies using NERSC resources in order to study 19 distinct um, adsorbents, atomic, uh, molecular fragments, and molecular um, that are common to various catalytic processes. And here we present the eight metals in the order I already presented them, so softest uh, to uh, hardest metal. The table is color-coded, and the numerical entry in each uh, table a cell represents the temperature at which you have one ejection event of metal atom per second. So blue illustrates the easiest to eject um, uh, metal atoms with the presence of various adsorbents or in vacuum. And red, as it is on the right hand side, so iridium, you have to go to higher energies and um, higher temperatures in order to eject metal atoms. Interestingly now, what I'm going to do is to show you a list, a non-exhaustive list of catalytic reactions that are of wide interest and uh, they utilize lots of energy um, that um, uh, would be relevant uh, in the context of this metal-metal bond breaking. Very first one is low temperature water gas shift reaction. Uh, catalyzed by copper takes place in between around 500 degrees Kelvin. If you now look at copper and CO, this tells me that at already below room temperature, 264 Kelvin, um, and at the dilute limit, not much CO, I can have one ejection of copper atom per second. Imagine now this realistic temperature taking place in in the factory, um, how many more events, ejection events you are going to have. Similar methanol synthesis uh, is catalyzed by copper. Reactants is CO, CO2, and hydrogen taking place at uh, um, several tenths of atmospheres, high pressure reaction, and 500 uh, degrees Kelvin and above, okay? Um, imagine now this, uh, reaction turns out consumes two to three percent of all energy produced on the planet on an annual basis. If you can understand the reaction mechanism and uh, decrease the temperature at which, find a new catalyst that decreases the temperature at which this reaction needs to uh, to be run, you can save the environment a tremendous deal of energy production, which goes hand in hand with polluting the environment. So apparently it's another reaction that needs to be revisited in the context of this phenomenon that has been ignored uh, so far. Ammonia oxidation and ore reduction by hydrogen, methane oxidation on palladium, and methane steam reforming on nickel. That's the way that we are making hydrogen today through thermal catalysis. And you can see this is taking place on nickel. Obviously, 400 Kelvin is enough to get that nickel-nickel bond breaking. If this is happening um, at 1,000 degrees Kelvin, imagine the, the extent to which this phenomenon will be present. 
So the question then is, um, how is the reactivity of these novel active sites that are the ejected atoms and the clusters you form from them um, compared to the reactivity of standard sites that people have been thinking so far for um, understanding heterogeneous catalysis or electrocatalysis. So in this particular case, we took a very simple reaction, C oxidation of copper, and we drew here, uh, using density functional theory, the potential energy surface. Here is the reactant CO and oxygen, adsorb CO, adsorb oxygen. Now this is the transition state to get to the product of the reaction CO2. The lower the energy level in this uh, cell is, the more reactive the active site will be. We monitor this um, uh, transition state energy on the right-hand side plot. And you can see here that, say, this transition state energy of copper 111, 100, 2111, these are all standard facets people have been considering and explaining reactivity. The monomer has very high energy transition state energy. It's a bad catalyst. The dimer is good. In fact, the trimer, this green bar, is impressively good. So if you compare a trimer for CO oxidation on copper, okay, a trimer of copper, uh, it should be about 12 orders of magnitude, higher reaction rate at room temperature. So it's an enormous difference. One of these guys can do the job of 10 to the 12 of the Terra's most stable sites. So having trimers, could clearly dominate uh, reactivity. Um, so far, I've spoken about what happens in the presence of very uh, small amounts of CO uh, and under vacuum, the um, energetics needed to eject a copper atom out of the copper kink uh, site. So it's about 85 kilojoules per mole in the absence of everything under vacuum. But then, as you can see here, the more CO you put in your environment, and if you reach the state that all the step edges and kink sites are covered by CO, okay, which can happen at modest temperatures, uh, even below atmospheric uh, pressures, you see that the ejection energetics drops precipitously, 35 kilojoules per mole. So it would be orders of magnitude, orders of magnitude. Um, massive ejection of atoms, copper atoms, back and forth in a dynamic sense, that would be relevant here. Now, uh, after you do this, you ask the question, okay, and um, how stable these enormously active materials are, are, the sites are, the trimers? So we use kinetic Monte Carlo simulations, uh, taking advantage of the energetics that we develop with density functional theory. And we evolve over time um, the formation of various atoms and that clusters to simulate the environment shown here in the experimental results. And you can see you start with that atoms, uh, you generate more and more of these, start agglomerating, making bigger and bigger clusters. But these red circles indicate trimers. It turns out that these trimers persist. They are not that many, but they can still dominate chemistry at conditions relevant to what was reported by the Berkeley groups a few years back. So with that, let me conclude. Um, I hope that um, I conveyed some of the lessons that we learned using uh, extensively uh, NERSC resources and density functional theory. That metal-metal bond breaking can definitely happen under catalytic reaction conditions. This is um, as trivial as may sound. It's, it's an assumption that has uh, not been challenged to the extent it should, in my opinion. The uh, bond breaking processes are governed by delicate balance between the cohesive metal energy of the metal and the strength of the metal adsorbent uh, bond. Uh, clearly, we saw that adsorbent coverage that connects with pressure, uh, gas, reactive gases, um, and surface structure, kinks versus terraces versus step edges, determine the ejection energetics and kinetics. We demonstrated that clusters of ejected atoms generated in situ under reaction conditions generate new reactive intermediates with significant lower energy paths for catalytic reactions that would lead to complete reconsideration of several of these very important reactions.
practically important reactions. And finally, uh, for more scientific uh, inclined people, there is always the so-called heterogeneous homogeneous catalysis gap. The, the smaller the number of metal atoms implicated in heterogeneous catalysis active site, the closer you get to homogeneous catalysis active sites, because in, in homogeneous catalysis, one or two metal atoms typically included in the active site, the rest is ligand. So I think this is an interesting connection that may be developed. So essentially, you in situ generate pretty much your homogeneous uh, uh, catalytic active site in the context of heterogeneous catalysis. With that, let me thank again, once again, the tremendous job that NERSC has done uh, for a, uh, over half a century now. We couldn't do all of this without uh, their help and resources, both uh, human resources and uh, the computational resources. The funding that comes from the Department of Energy, Basic Energy Sciences, the Catalyst Science Program, Miller Institute, who is sponsored by visit uh, at UC Berkeley, my collaborators at Berkeley and uh, TU Munich, plus group members, current group members uh, here in Madison, who have worked um, extensively in the project that I uh, presented to you today. In closing, let me wish um, uh, happy 50th birthday to NERSC. And again, thanks to NERSC for its leadership and excellent service to the entire computational community, not only in the US, understand, for over half a century. And thanks to you for your attention. I'll be delighted to take any questions you might have. Yes, thank you very much. That was that was fascinating. Um, yeah, great talk. Like I said, we'll probably have time for maybe one or two quick questions. If anybody has one, you can put it in chat. Um, I, I have a quick question, um, which is, so you mentioned that, I mean, for a number of these calculations, you're using VASP with, with the PBE functional. How, how dependent do you think the answers are on, on that choice? And do you, do you consider going beyond PBE in the future? I, I thank you for that question. It's actually a very critical choice to make. Um, you have to be able to capture the adsorbed metal interaction accurately. And for that, we benchmark against single crystal adsorption microcalorimetry experiments, right? And the other factor that you need to capture well in this project is the metal-metal bond strength, the cohesive energy of the metal. It turns out that there aren't that many um, experimental data if you go beyond monometallics, which is the area we are moving on now, okay, in that project. But um, depending on the metal, PBE is doing uh, better or um, more poorly. For instance, gold is the Achilles heel um, in this uh, set of eight metals. We found that PBE plus D3 is doing a much better job capturing the experimental cohesive energy for gold. So I would argue um, we have done, but not published yet, a very extensive with 10 different functionals. Uh, I see. Okay. Study to figure out. It turns out that we published PB because it was, for monometallics at least, that has the mean absolute error. If you go over the entire metals, it was the best. All right, thanks. All right. Well, thank you again. Um, You're welcome. Thank you for the opportunity and thank okay. you for all you guys do for the community.